In a dark corner of the Alexandrovsky region of Siberia, surrounded by icy waters, lies a dark, murky island with a bloody past. This bloody past, hidden from the world, is Joseph Stalin's most tainted legacy, and is now the reason why this deserted island is unofficially known as Cannibal Island. In 1929, Joseph Stalin faced a serious problem. Ukrainian farmers were rebelling against his policy of collectivization, and instead of giving up their food and farms they chose to burn their crops rather than submit to his tyrannical demands. Those who opposed the state were persecuted and, in time, were declared enemies, as was anyone else who disagreed with Stalin's policies. As a result of that defiance, hundreds of thousands of peasants were arrested and deported, as well as other groups targeted by Stalin's reforms. Among the many reforms of Stalin was the reintroduction of internal passports. This was an important initiative of the Bolsheviks and allowed Stalin to chain the peasants to the land and was deemed essential for the industrialization of the Soviet Union. In December 1932, a decree drafted and approved by the Politburo, established that all citizens over the age of 16, must obtain an internal passport and residence permit to confirm their status. And anyone who did not do fruitful work or had fled the country in search of a better life was denied a passport and residence permit, and became a victim of the state's productivity campaign. Consequently, the indiscriminate rounding up of the undocumented victims of this policy and without judicial review condemned people, to a miserable existence in the labor camps of the Soviet Union. And by 1933, the Soviet Gulag system had collapsed under the weight of this chaotic policy, and a solution was desperately needed. On March 11, 1933, the leader of the collectivization campaign, Heinrich Yagoda, found an ingenious solution to the problem, or so he thought. The plan was to take two million dissidents to Siberia, equip them with machinery and establish collective farms. These new farms would eliminate hunger while the harsh climate of Siberia would provide the well-deserved punishment. The police were now issued with urgent orders to increase arrests, and fearing for their own safety if the quotas were not met, kidnapped people from the streets, and by April 1933, trainloads of people endured the brutal journey to Siberia to labor on some of the most inhospitable land on earth. By late April, 90,000 people had arrived in Tomsk, a remote city in central Russia, and most of those unfortunate ones were not peasants accustomed to farming but political dissidents and criminals, together with urban dwellers without internal passports. The Tomsk committee, not ready to accept so many people and fearing that the urban and criminal population would become violent and unruly, chose one of the most desolate places near the village of Nazino to build a collective farm. 5,000 dissidents, already weakened by disease and hunger, were quickly rounded up, forced onto barges and sent 800 kilometers to a small marshy island. This harrowing journey, was to cost 27 lives and was a precursor to the madness that was to come. They arrived on the island on May 18, and were immediately abandoned. The Tomsk committee, in a hurry to rid themselves of the problem, failed to supply the dissidents with supplies, equipment, and shelter, or the means to build any. That night, 295 of the remaining dissidents that slept outside in the open, perished from exposure. The next morning, the soldiers now out of sight and out of mind, and tired of baking bread, gave each prisoner 200 grams of raw flour and then hoarded the remaining 20 tons for themselves. Driven by hunger, many of the unfortunate dissidents mixed raw flour with putrid water, causing dysentery and killing even more people. Each night, more would perish while sleeping in the open, and others would be badly burned when they slept too close to open fires. Days later and faced with no food, a riot forced the soldiers back to the island, and it was agreed with the dissidents that the flour rations would be resumed. The dissidents had to form brigades of 150, and each brigade would choose a representative to be responsible for collecting and distributing the flour. As a result of this agreement, hardened criminals, ready to do anything to survive, 
appointed themselves as leaders of the brigades, and hoarded the flour for themselves. For their part, the soldiers did nothing to prevent this injustice, and it's from this point on that everything rapidly descends into madness. On May 25, 1933, a week after the dissidents were abandoned on the island, the camp doctor noticed the disturbing signs of cannibalism. When he reported it to his superiors, they told him to ignore it. After all, they were undesirables, and the Soviet Union was well rid of them. Given the attitude of the Tomsk committee, it is not surprising that the soldiers turned out to be so sadistic. For sport, they shot dissidents from their barges and killed them at will. They threw pieces of bread to the hungry dissidents and laughed as they fought over it. They exchanged food for sex, and cigarettes for gold teeth pulled from the mouths of the unfortunate. And anyone strong enough to survive swimming across the Ob River to escape the madness was shot in midstream, or hunted down for sport. By May 27, 1933, another 1,000 dissidents had arrived on the island. Still without the equipment and supplies necessary for survival, and with starving thugs roaming the island, cannibalism was rampant. The debauched suffering was now so great that even the Tomsk committee could not ignore it, and in mid-June, with more than 4,000 unfortunate dissidents dead or missing, the committee abruptly dissolved the settlement. The surviving dissidents, forever scarred by their survival were evacuated to other collective farms. And the soldiers responsible for the sadistic madness were sent back to Tomsk. Back in Tomsk, the soldiers who had participated in and encouraged the madness had their party memberships revoked and were jailed for a paltry 12 months. In July 1933, Vasily Velichko, who lived near the collective farms along the Ob River, heard the first rumor of cannibalism associated with the small farm near the town of Nazino. And without informing his superiors, he decided to visit the village and investigate the matter. He arrived at the beginning of August, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary, the village was going about its business and the island seemed calm. Only when he stepped onto the island, did he encounter the horror of the corpses hidden in the tall grass. And over the next few weeks, Belichko interviewed everyone who would talk to him, slowly building a picture of what had happened during the short months of the camp's miserable existence. Later that year, Belichko submitted an 11-page report to his superiors in Moscow, where he was promptly fired, and his party membership revoked. Consequently, none of Belichko's findings became public, and the horrors of the island remained a secret until the collapse of the Soviet Union. After the collapse, Belichko's findings were published, detailing the Soviet Union's failure to plan and protect its citizens while undergoing a desperate struggle for survival. It described the moral breakdown of the soldiers, as well as the state's responsibility for the horrors endured by the population as a result of the criminalization campaign, and what fellow human beings are capable of, when faced with desperate choices.